The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Okay, now we're going to have someone that's going to refute everything I said earlier. Uh, I'd like to introduce Matt Munsick. He's with uh, Morgan Corporation, Spartanburg, South Carolina. They've gotten in, in a big way with roller compacted concrete. Uh, like I say, they've done a lot of different pavement operations. I think you'll enjoy his presentation. Please welcome Matt. Thank you, Wayne. I'd first uh, like to start off by saying it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited uh, to, to speak in front of you all today, a, a lowly contractor as myself. We're, we're going to leave the world, the theoretical world of engineering and get down to the ground level where the rubber meets the road and we actually have to do this to feed our families. As Wayne said, we are relatively new in RCC, about four years or so into it. Uh, we, we do pavements and we do also have done a couple of dam jobs. Uh, some of you may be uh, aware of the history of RCC and, you know, kind of where it was, how it was conceived, you know. Uh, RCC was a pavement that somebody said, hey, we need something hard, durable, efficient, goes down fast, we can put it in remote places. Uh, we don't really care what it looks like. We just want something to stand up to keep our equipment out of the mud that we can use all, uh, you know, just beat the heck out of. And uh, I know I've, I've borrowed a few slides here, uh, but, you know, a tank doesn't care what the pavement looks like. A, a log loader doesn't care what it looks like. A gantry crane doesn't care what it looks like. As long as it holds up, doesn't rut, and we're not spending a ton of money every year maintaining this stuff. So that's kind of where RCC uh, is conceived, the, 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 the theories behind where it's conceived. And what we're trying to do now is, you know, evil capitalists, a contractor like myself, what, where can, uh, what markets can we expand and use RCC uh, in, in other places as well? Uh, this is a picture, and I wish I had a close-up of the surface, but it, uh, it, it's a really, really good-looking surface. We've done about 160 acres right now of 4-inch RCC for a uh, light-duty uh, parking lot uh, at a nuclear power plant that's being built in South Georgia. They like it so much uh, that we're doing all the heavy haul roads within the interior of the plant itself uh, for the construction of the plant and uh, as a permanent uh, access and haul roads for the reactor when it is up and running. Uh, one thing that they loved about the concrete, well, number one, was price. Uh, we Six inches of soil cement and four inches of RCC, uh, we uh, beat six inches of stone and two inches of asphalt surface. Uh, we beat them by about 25% on initial cost. Uh, number two, the heat island effect. When you walk off the, uh, this is in South Georgia, it gets you know very similar weather to what you all have out here in, in the Dallas area, very humid, hot and humid. When you walk off the asphalt onto the RCC, you can actually feel about a 10 degree, 10 to 12 degree temperature drop. Uh, you see the, the lighting that they've used, that they cut down on their lighting as well. They reduced their lighting uh, by about half, uh, half the lumens, and one of the, the Shaw engineers uh, came up with that. And it's also a very sustainable pavement. Uh, this is, was meant to be a temporary parking lot, and the owner, which is a southern company, uh, says, heck, you know, this stuff looks good. We're just going to go ahead and keep it. That's just less acreage we have to mow and have to worry about erosion maintenance. So methods, uh, things we want to look for for a, su a successful construction project in RCC is uh, appropriate materials. Uh, RCC, like I said, can be used in a wide uh, array of projects, you know, from a log sort yard to a, a light duty parking lot that uh, you have, you know, people walking and driving on every day. So you can use some coarse aggregates, as we saw in Frank's uh, uh, presentation. It's going to be very durable, very hard. But if we want the aesthetics, we're going to have to marry uh, the world of, of 
strength and durability with, you know, does it look good and is it still cost effective to, to produce and construct appropriate plans and specifications. You know, RCC hasn't been out there in the mainstream construction world for very long. And, uh, there are, you know, PCA, ACI have some really good uh, specs uh, for concrete pavements, RCC concrete pavements. Uh, there's also some good specs out there for dam construction, RCC dam construction. And what we're uh, seeing now is uh, some Franken specs where people are pulling, uh, you know, a paragraph or two here and a paragraph or two here, and, hey, they use it in this job over in, in Tennessee or in Georgia, and they're putting them together, and, you know, you're kind of scratching your head, to, you know, what, what in the world are they trying to do to us here, you know. Uh, so having a specification for each project, uh, I think, is, is, is critical, especially when you go across the country, uh, your weather conditions change, your heat, your, your, uh, your humidity levels, all that affects your moisture and your placement methods. Another key factor in a successful RCC job is, you know, having a contractor that not only can spell RCC, but understands what it is and, and how to place it. it. It's a different animal. I've, uh, I've built a lot of things, uh, been on many uh, types of construction sites, but I'd say RCC is uh, it, it's one that'll fool you. You think it's simple because it's aggregate cement and water, but it's a completely different, different animal. It goes down like asphalt, looks like concrete, but it's not. And uh, it, it, it's... It, there's a learning curve to it, and that's, that's all I'll say about that right now. Make sure your equipment can deal with this uh, product, too. It's very dry. It's very stiff. It's very dense. Uh, I've heard asphalt pavers being mentioned, and, and they work up to a certain, a certain lift thickness, but for proper consolidation and compaction, especially at the bottom of that slab, high-density screed pavers are definitely the way to go. Uh, you know, as was mentioned before, also uh, the wear and tear on the high-density paper is less than a, than a typical conventional asphalt paper. So, you know, having the right equipment uh, makes a huge difference in, in placing RCC. Uh, a, a project where RCC has not been done before, I can't stress enough how communication is important and having everybody on board from the owner, the design engineer, and the contractor. I don't think you can communicate enough about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it because... Well, once you start uh, producing material in a plant and it starts going down, it, there's no stopping. It, it's not a product that uh, starts and stops very easily. It's, it's uh, dependent on uh, consistency and continuity. And uh, you know, last for a successful construction project is a, a construction plan. From your mix design to your, uh, your test pad to your ac actual uh, installation and curing, finishing, sawing, all of those things need to be taken into consideration. I want to start off by uh, talking about specifications for the job. And as Wayne mentioned in his presentation, you have to realize, understand, what exactly are we building here? Do we want something that's going to hold the tank up, or do we want something that's, uh, you know, are we going to do something on the main line road that people are going to travel every day, or are we going to work in a subdivision, uh, pave a subdivision road? You have to know what you're building and have the specifications address the needs of that whichever environment that you're going to construct in. You know, do your weather, your traffic patterns, how, because all that affects your joints, your daily productions, and all that in turn affects your cost. Uh, conflicts, uh, utilities are a big one. We do a lot of RCC paving in some uh, urban areas, city streets, removal of existing asphalt pavements and uh, installation of RCC. So you have driveways, businesses, manholes, water valves, uh, valve boxes, fire hydrants and things, and, and that's just what you can see. When you go in there and you start tearing the road out, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of other things that uh, you come into contact with. i got a couple pictures of those, too. Uh, and lastly is uh, quality control. Like I said, RCC, uh, you, you blend uh, uh, a few theory worlds of theory as far as your soil cement, your geotechnical aspects, to your concrete, to your asphalt world, and you bring them all together and having uh, a good quality control program and Abiding by that is critical for RCC. And talking about aggregates, our aggregates in RCC compose about 85% of the mix, so they are very important. Uh, they'll affect your workability, they'll affect your strength, how much cement content you use, how much water your water demand. So having a, a good quality, sound, consistent aggregate is, is important. I would put it third uh, in the list of, of key attributes to RCC. Number one is moisture, maintaining the right amount of moisture. Two is density. Without density, you don't get strength. And 
you can't get density without the right moisture. And third would be your aggregate selection. You know, what are, exactly are we going to use in RCC as far as our coarse aggregate? And you'll see in some RCC, RCC mixes the fine aggregate is a greater composition than your coarse. So your fines, you know, those 100s, 200s, the shape of those particles really affect your strength as well uh, and, and how tight your RCC is once it's compacted. Uh, low SSD and what being well graded is, is very important as well. And here's a, a, a picture of what I look for in uh, an RCC gradation. And what I do is I blend at least two products. In most quarries in our area in the southeast, I can get a good coarse uh, three-quarter inch minus coarse aggregate. And our, our screenings are, are fairly, fairly decent. We have to be careful in our area. We have granite and how they crush. Uh, the smaller particles tend to be flat and elongated that we try to stay away from. But this is a, a, a good RCC gradation curve. This is of that job that I showed the picture of the big parking lot. What we, there, there were two aggregate suppliers in the area. This is from the other aggregate supplier that swears he can, he can make the gradation I want. We're still in spec technically, and this is the, this is the PCA ACI RCC gradation curve. So yes, it is in spec, but I'm a little gap graded, and that is something that we want to stay away from because here I, th this mix required more cement to get, to, to achieve the, the, the similar strength. So if I can use the other aggregate, I use less cement, it's lower cost, and I get the same strength. So, uh, this, this mix is also is a little more difficult to get density on. We had to roll it seven or eight times versus four times on the other mix. So just, just that one little sieve and that curve affected our density and our cost because of our cement content that we had to add. So those are, you know, very important things you have to take in, into consideration with RCC. And another one is uh, the geometry, and that was brought up earlier too, and I can't stress enough, RCC likes big flat areas, continuous movements, and 90 degree angles, especially in your contours. When they, uh, we sold RCC on the job, and then they sent me the grading plan, and I looked at this, I said, no, this is, no, <laughs> not going to happen. So we went in there and we actually soil cemented it and we smoothed those contours up a little bit. We couldn't, the, the storm drain system was already in, so we couldn't move everything and put it in line. Uh, I don't know who, who designed this. I asked a question and nobody would tell me. It was probably a good thing. But uh, when we had something like this, I can't stress enough how important a pool plan is. And this is something that took me about four or five uh, versions or drafts of this. Uh, to construct a pool plan, but what the pool plan does is you know how wide you're paving every day, so you know how to set your paver up. You know what your productions are going to be every day, but more importantly is your drainage and the location of all your joints, your fresh joints, your construction joints, your cold joints, and your isolation joints. And that is one of the most important things you can get out of the pool plan. And that, like I said, uh, if you spec a job for RCC, talk with your contractor, have them submit a pool plan before they uh, you know, I'd, I'd submit mine when I uh, submit my mix design. Th this is what we want to do as far as construction. You know, does anybody have a problem with this? Naturally, when we get started, the owner says, uh, no, we don't want you to start where you need to start. We want you to start on the other side. So this got thrown out the window, too. So what, what do they say about the road to somewhere being paved with good intentions? But this is a, uh, a, a picture of a pool plan in action. Uh, we'll pave across the back end of the job we're paving uh, longitudinally so our paver has something to sit on, sit on uh, uh, the right grade to sit on and uh, it's just a picture of uh, when you do pull, uh, do uh, make a pull plan this is uh, how, you, how you put it to use. Uh, next is the, is the joints. Uh, we can spend days talking about uh, RCC joints unfortunately we only have a few minutes but there are four main types of joints that you need to take into consideration. One is your construction joint, and that would be like a coal joint at the end of every day. Uh, how do you prepare that leading edge transversely and longitudinally for paving for the next day? Uh, a fresh joint is a joint. Uh, most people say be between 60 minutes or less, uh, if, if you tie a new pool or a new lane of RCC to it, uh, that would be considered a fresh joint. I probably need to take that off. Uh, a, a cold joint would be a joint that if you're paving in 60 minutes, it's been 60 minutes or more, and that RCC has already started to hydrate where it's real stiff, it's not going to compact. Uh, how do you treat that? I mean, most times we'll, we'll cut it off back into the fresh RCC. 
or we just leave it alone, let it go for the next day, and we'll saw cut it and make it a construction joint. But cold joints, you want to kind of stay away from when you're actually placing RCC because if you place fresh material up against uh, material that's been there for over 60 minutes, it's already, it's already stiffened up, you're not going to get compaction on it, uh, it will probably lead to a failure on down the road. And fourth would be an isolation joint. And that would be around like a storm drain or a structure, um, a curb. You don't want your RCC to be bonded to uh, another piece of concrete. And there are different ways to approach isolation joints. I don't think there's anything in writing as far as what you do uh, or what materials you use or, or a method. We've kind of had to invent our own methods and what we do in, in this situation or that situation with our isolation joints. I'll tell you, the most, one of the most effective ways I've used uh, or I treat an isolation joint is just use roofing felt. Take some uh, construction adhesive. I'm going up against a curb and gutter and they don't want to bond it to the curb. Uh, I'll put some construction adhesive on there, put the roofing felt on it, and that works really well. I haven't had a lot of uh, faith in an expansion joint material because I don't think we get good compaction against that material. And if you don't get compaction on RCC, you don't get the strength, and it's eventually going to ravel out on you. Moisture, maintaining moisture, as I said before, in RCC is probably one of the most important characteristics in, uh, to, to achieve a good RCC, a good high-quality job especially on your joint, especially on that fresh joint. Uh, you start paving in the morning at 7, 8 o'clock, you know, your, your temperature is relatively low. In the summertime, you know, down in the south, our humidity is high, that's good. But as the day starts heating up, you're going to start losing a lot of that water. Like I said, you only have 6% moisture content. You don't have enough bleed water in there uh, to, to, to maintain hydration through the, through the hydration process. So we cover that joint sometimes. We keep it wet with a water truck, but you got to be careful with a water truck. You don't splash up a lot of soil or clay onto that joint as well. So you have to keep it clean, but keep it wet. And when you're paving a large industrial area, you know that joint might be three or four hundred feet long. And it's it's the it's always uh, interesting. I'll say I'll use that's a good word uh, to maintain that moisture in that RCC because you're trying to pave as you know get as much material down as possible but still make sure that joint is acceptable. Here's a picture uh, on the upper left of a construction joint where we saw, uh, this was actually a, a road that we did in Gaffney, South Carolina. We did, we pulled one lane, and then the milling machine milled out the other side, and when it did, it had a lot of, left a lot of dirt on our solid edge. So we went through one, we applied water to it, and it washed all the, all the, the soil and dust and dirt off of it. And it also, you know, that water will help bond that next pull to that, uh, the previous day's construction. This is a, a picture of a fresh joint where we want to stay about two feet off that leading edge. It's going to stay a little higher. And when we place our next pull on that side, that'll get rolled together and you won't even see a joint in there as long as that moisture has been maintained properly. Picture of a construction joint. This is the way we typically like to do it. We, we saw cut all of our construction joints vertically and wash them off uh, so we uh, get a nice tie in. There, you can use a shoe on a paver. Everywhere where I've seen that done, you, know, you have that little wedge. It's, on, it's always on a 15 degree angle, but I don't think you get compaction down there on the toe the, of that little slope. And when you go to try to tie in, the RCC has very little paste in it and you know a lot of half inch and quarter inch size aggregate. There's not enough paste in there to hold that t the top of that uh, joint together. And it ten, has a tendency to rattle out about an inch and a half wide, about a half inch deep. And uh, so it, it, it's a little little more expensive and time consuming, but we uh, we want to cut everything. Because like I said, we're trying to uh, get in that market where aesthetics are important. To touch on subgrades, uh, Wayne mentioned it earlier, and I can't say enough, you can't get compaction on top of a marshmallow. The subgrades need to be very important. This was actually that job we did in Gaffney in uh, the DOT job. When that milling machine got down, the only thing that kept it from turning over was that power pole right there. And I called the RCE out. This was the first day. I called the RCE out, the resident construction engineer, and said, uh, you know, we got you know, we'll do something about this. We have to undercut this and put some good material in and get it back a good subgrade and, and put RCC on top of that. He said, oh, no, no, it'll be all right. Just pour the RCC on it. It'll get hard. You know, my heart just stopped right then there. So, number one, we don't pour RCC. It gets placed. And uh, we went ahead and... He, he stood by it, and I went ahead and cut it out anyway. He didn't want to cut it out. I, I said, if it's on me, I'm going to cut it out because I don't want to come back next week, next month, and, and uh, dig this thing back up again. 
But uh, what we want to look for is a good free draining subgrade, homogenous, and that's why I like the soil cement, our subgrades under the RCC. If not for a treatment, to just or use a treatment, not a modification, you know, just a little two or three percent to try it, because our soil is very, we have silt, sands, and clays, and a mixture thereof, and it changes every 20, 30 feet in the southeast. But that soil cement actually helps homogenize that subgrade a lot. And uh, it makes a big difference uh, with the RCC. It reduces our compactive effort. And one thing about RCC, the less that you put that roller on it, the better off you'll be. The more compaction you can get by having the moisture right in your mix, having your paver set up correctly, and using the right roller, uh, it makes a huge difference on your ride and on your density, your aesthetics as well. Quality control. Can't say enough about quality control. How do we, how do we check uh, ourselves? How do we know we're doing right? How do we know we're giving the owner what they're paying for? RCC cylinders. In our mix design, what I like to try to do is I will make 20 cylinders in a mix design. And we'll do breaks at 3, 4, 5, 7, 14, 21, 28 days. It's a little expensive up front, but I think it gives us a lot of good data. And I'll explain why in a minute when we go to do our test sections. But uh, there's an ASTM standard for the cylinders, <clears throat> and it's a very good way to, to monitor what you're doing. You can take it from that mix design, you, that unit weight of RCC is very important because you can correlate your flexural strengths and your modulus of elasticity to that unit weight from data that you can get in the lab. Your weather conditions, like I said, in RCC, uh, we might have to change our moisture contents in our plant four, three, four, five, six times a day depending on your stockpile, uh, free water content, and you know what, what your environmental conditions are. Stockpile management, again, is critical. Your loader man can kill you if you're not careful. If he's eating in the, into the center of a pile and he's loading it, and all of a sudden he starts working on the outside of the pile where your moisture content, your free water content went from 4% down to 1.5, uh, and all of a sudden you can't get grade, your paver's riding up, uh, your loader man is responsible. That's the first place I go. Grade control with RCC. RCC is very stiff. It comes out of a paver. Our paver floats just like an asphalt paver. There's no hydraulic up and down like a slip form paver has. So moisture, the fluctuation in moisture content can affect your grade. I mean, it can affect your grade up to an inch. And uh, if you're paving on a city street, you're up an inch and down an inch. And that's, that's not going to get it. That's going to create a lot of work and cost on the back end. Test sections. If you do an RCC job, I can't stress enough about having constructing a good test section. Uh, you know, in the world of contracting, a lot of specs say 28 days prior to full production. As a contractor, it's difficult to have mobilize our equipment, set it up on site, and have it sit there for 28 days. And that's where I make all those uh, extra cylinders in the mix design phase is, so if we do a test section, I like to show up, you know, eight or nine days before work. You know, I, we talk to the engineer saying, look, we'll do the test section. We'll make 10, 12 cylinders off the test section. We'll correlate that put it on a graph and show you what we did in the lab so we can see our three-day, our five-day, our seven-day strengths and strength curves, lay them on top of one another if we're consistent or if our unit weights are consistent at the right moisture content, then you know in 28 days this is what you're going to get. So that's one thing that's, that's very important. Uh, you're also, you know, going from a lab environment to the real-world environment where you're running material through a pug mill, putting it out with a paver and putting a 10-ton roller on it's different than making a cylinder in a lab, you know, using a little... Uh, mobile portal mixer and uh, making cylinders that way, making your mix some cylinders that way. So you have to test out, and another thing from your test section is your roller pattern. How many times do we have to roll it to get density? What does the moisture content have to be coming out of the plant and then coming out of the paper? Because when you add your water in the plant, by the time it gets on the ground and you're rolling it, your moisture content, if it's a 90 degree day and the wind's blowing, you might lose two or 3% moisture in 30 minutes. So that's why a test section is, is very, very important. It also shows the client, hey, this is what I'm buying. This is what we're going to get. This is how the operation works. And they get to see some material on the ground on their site before you go in full production. And again, uh, I hate to be redundant. I did not go to the School of Redundancy School, but compaction, our compactors that we use, our compaction effort is very important. I think I should change it to like an hour. But it does, uh, your use in your selection of compaction equipment, you know, affects your strength, what your mat looks like when you're done, your smoothness, your permeability of your surface as well. I like to use 
uh, of the 10 ton roller. And sometimes when we do four inch RCC or five inch RCC, we don't need a 10 ton roller. And it's better to use a six ton and the four ton because you don't want to over roll. Like I said, over rolling is one of the, the downfalls of, of RCC that uh, people don't understand it. Uh, you start breaking that aggregate back and that's not a good thing. And I like to use this little four ton uh, combination roller because those pneumatic wheels, they'll take out those little roller marks from the 10 ton and uh, really make that surface look good and tight and uniform. Our curing, uh, this is uh, the Matt Munsick uh, patented curing rig here, where we just take a tote of, of curing compound, put it in the back of a three quarter ton pickup truck, and like I said, we, we drive right on the RCC as soon as we're done rolling. Quality control testing again, very similar to a soil a soil testing operation using nuclear gauge. And one thing you'll need to say is very important about a nuclear gauge. Nuclear gauges will give you consistent results, but on your moisture it won't be entirely accurate. You will need to burn off the one point check. I tell my guys to do it every day. I don't think it happens that often. But your nuke gauge is going to read a percent, percent and a half low consistently to what your material actually is. It'll give you the, the right unit weight, but it, you know, if you're looking for plus or minus 2%, if that's what the spec says, the new gauge, uh, you will have to apply a correction factor to it. And cut your control joints and cure as soon as possible. Like I said, you don't have enough water to uh, afford having it evaporate out of your surface in RCC. And cores and cylinders, uh, quick, uh, talking about a quick story about a core. I, I did uh, plan on bringing a core, and when I got out of my truck yesterday at the airport, I threw it in my computer, my laptop bag, and uh, going through the TSA, they stopped. They stopped me and, uh, what's this, son? I said, well, it's a core. A core of what? And the, the other guy's going through uh, my laptop bag. I was in Tucson two weeks ago, and I went to the Titan Missile Museum, so I bought some bumper stickers. One of them said, got plutonium. And the other one uh, said, got missiles. So, oh, gracious. So then there's this guy. He's trying to take the core, and he's looking at it. And uh, 10 minutes, I said, you know, can I help you know, explain anything to you? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to open it. I, said, and I swear to God, that's a true story. I said, brother, I said, you, you're not going to open that thing. And that's when they pulled out the Got Plutonium bumper sticker, and then, here, then they called for backup. So needless to say, yesterday afternoon, I was the most popular person at the airport. So I couldn't bring a picture of a core, but uh, in testing cores versus cylinders, destructive testing in RCC, expect to uh, see a lot of variability in your data uh, versus uh, your cylinders uh, and what you do in the lab because uh, – you know, a six inch or an eight inch pavement, you're going to take a three or four inch core, and that's really not big enough uh, to capture what coarse aggregate you do have. You're, you're cutting through a lot of that three quarter inch and half inch material, and the variability of your strength, compressive strength, is going to is going to be, I will say, wide ranging out of cores. So that's why I think that unit weight is very important. If you can prove you have that unit weight in your material on the ground, and you can correlate that back to what you achieve compressive strength wise and flexural strength wise in the lab, that's more important than uh, cut a bunch of cores. Uh, one job we cut over 500 cores and our range was plus or minus 2,000 PSI from our average. So there's just a high degree of variability in destructive testing of RCC. Just to kind of sum up, you know, communicate your construction plans with all parties involved. Uh, a good qualitative test pad is, uh, is highly recommended. An established, established quality control program is important as well. And then, like I said, curing methods, can't say enough about. This is just some pictures of some jobs we've done. Yes, you can put it on a road. Uh, we got, uh, after diamond grinding, 45 inches per mile on a ride. Working around structures, you can see this uh, RCC in three days. They had a 600 ton crane, 80 ton air handlers on top of a manufacturing facility. But I'll just say one thing about RCC it's all about consistency, managing your variables. And uh, because there are a lot of them, as long as you don't have a lot of a lot of swings in your moisture and your aggregate uh, in your mixing process, uh, you, you kind of keep those variables down to a manageable level. You'll have a good RCC job. That 20-minute presentation is the shortest one I've ever done. I hope I didn't go over too long. <laughs>